I'd like to welcome you to the Austrian Circle. This is the program where we talk about the economics of freedom here on WHUS Stores 91.7 FM. So thank you very much for tuning into my show this morning. We are going to be talking a little bit more about the police on the show, continuing our talk about police brutality and police overstepping their roles as protectors and defenders of property and person. It has been discovered and published on by The Guardian that there is a, quote, black site in Chicago where the police are keeping people without any sort of access to uh, courts or justice system or lawyers or anything like that. They just grab them. They put them in a cell. There's no registering them in any sort of bookkeeping. Uh, And this is similar to what the CIA does around the world. They grab people, uh, what they call rendition, and then they lock them in these torture cells, and then they just don't let them go. They don't let anybody know that they grabbed them. They just grab them and hold them uh, for an indefinite amount of time. And uh, the police now are doing this around here. And this is what kind of I've been warning about. The war generally comes home to the domestic population. Uh, Germany had been attacking and killing and maiming a lot of people outside of its borders before it actually brought the concentration camps and the domestic suppression back home to its host population. And so this appears to be what's happening here in America. The police are becoming more and more violent, and we've gone over some of the reasons for that, because they're a monopoly, because they do not uh, suffer from profit and loss uh, based on their customers' whims. With the customer, when you have a normal business, the customer is going to buy or not buy based on the quality of your product, based on the price, based on whether you smiled at them, whether you um, had balloons in your shop and things like that. You know, there's all sorts of decisions decisions that are made by the customer based on the quality of the product that you are delivering to them. And with the police, there is no uh, consumer satisfaction that needs to be met because they are going to tax people, as with any bureaucratic organization, whether or not the product is good or whether the product is bad. This is, of course, nothing new. Uh, Lincoln did this during the war to prevent Southern secession. He uh, went and signed all these secret arrest warrants. He had uh, politicians arrested. He arrested a whole city council one time. He tried to arrest a congressperson. Uh, He just grabbed all these political dissidents who didn't like the war that he was fighting, uh, including journalists and all of these kinds of people, and locked them in gulags. He would just grab them and put them in a prison without any access to courts, and then after the war was over, finally they were allowed to be out. And so I wanted to read the article from The Guardian. I think it gives a lot of insight into what is um, happening around in the domestic population with the police. I think it also gives a lot of insight into what's been happening around the world. Uh, People who are not empathetic to the plight of all these innocent people who are being grabbed uh, by the CIA and tortured in these secret prisons around the world. Um, This is going to happen to people here as well. The government is not this kind of separate entity that treats foreign people differently than it treats the domestic population. The government acts in its own self-interest, as you know, any human organization would. And uh, if it's in its interest to grab people and throw them in a prison, then it's going to do that, especially because that's kind of the major role that the state has taken And so this article is posted by The Guardian, and uh, it's called The Disappeared. Chicago police detain Americans at abuse-laden black site. The Chicago Police Department operates an off-the-books interrogation compound, rendering Americans unable to be found by family or attorneys while locked inside what lawyers say is the domestic equivalent of a CIA black site. The facility, a nondescript warehouse on Chicago's west side known as Homan Square, has long been the scene of secretive work by special police units. Interviews with local attorneys and one protester, who spent the better part of a day shackled in Honan Square, described operations that deny access to basic constitutional rights. Alleged police practices at Homan Square, according to those familiar with the facility, who spoke out to The Guardian after its investigation into Chicago police abuse, include keeping arrestees out of official booking databases, beating by police resulting in head wounds, shackling for prolonged periods, denying attorneys access to the, quote, secure facility, 
holding people without legal counsel for between 12 and 24 hours, including people as young as 15. At least one man was found unresponsive in a Holman Square, quote, interview room and later pronounced dead. Brian Jacob Church, a protester known as one of the NATO Three, was held and questioned at Holman Square in 2012 following a police raid. Officers restrained Church for the better part of a day, denying him access to an attorney before sending him to a nearby police station to be booked and charged. Holman Square is definitely an unusual place, Church told The Guardian on Friday. Quote, it brings to mind the interrogation facilities they use in the Middle East. The CIA calls them black sites. It's a domestic black site. When you go in, no one knows what's happened to you. The secretive warehouse is the latest example of Chicago police practices that echo the much-criticized attention abuses of the U.S. war on terrorism. While those abuses impacted people overseas, Home and Square, said to house military-style vehicles, interrogation cells, and even a cage, trains its focus on Americans, most often poor, black, and brown. Unlike a precinct, no one taken to Home and Square is said to be booked. Witnesses, suspects, or other Chicagoans who end up inside do not appear to have a public searchable record entered into a database indicated where they are, as happens when someone is booked at a precinct. Lawyers and relatives insist that there is no way of finding their whereabouts. Those lawyers who have attempted to gain access to Home and Square are most often turned away, even as their clients remain in custody inside. Quote, it's sort of an open secret among attorneys that regularly make police station visits. This place, if you can't find a client in the system, odds are they're there, said Chicago lawyer Julia Bartness. Chicago civil rights attorney Flint Taylor said Home and Square represented a routinization of a notorious practice in local police work that violates the Fifth and Sixth Amendments of the Constitution. Quote, this home and square revelation seems to me to be an institutionalization of the practice that dates back more than 40 years, Taylor said, of violating a suspect or witness's rights to a lawyer and not to be physically or otherwise coerced into giving a statement. Much remains hidden about home and square. The Chicago Police Department did not respond to the Guardian's questions about the facility. But after the Guardian published this story, the department provided a statement insisting, without specifics, that there is nothing untoward taking place at what is called the sensitive location home to undercover units. Quote, the Chicago Police Department abides by all laws, rules, and guidelines pertaining to any interviews of suspects or witnesses at Home and Square or any other CPD facility. If lawyers have a client detained at Home and Square, just like any other facility, they are allowed to speak to and visit them. It also houses CPD's Evidence Recovery Property section, where the public is able to claim inventoried property, the statement said, something numerous attorneys and one Home and Square arrestee have denied. Quote, there are always records of anyone who is arrested by CPD, and this is not any different at Home and Square, it continued. The Chicago police statement did not address how long into an arrest or detention those records are generated or their availability to the public. A department spokesperson did not respond to a detailed request for clarification. When a Guardian reporter arrived at the warehouse on Friday, a man at the gatehouse outside refused any entrance and would not answer questions. Quote, this is a secure facility. You're not even supposed to be standing here, said the man who refused to give his name. A former Chicago police superintendent and a more recently retired detective, both of whom have been inside Home and Square in the last few years in a post-police capacity, said the police department did not operate out of the warehouse until the late 1990s. But in detailing episodes involving their clients over the past several years, lawyers described mad scrambles that led to the closed doors of Home and Square, a place most had never heard of previously. The facility was even unknown to Rob Warden, the founder of Northwestern University Law School's Center on Wrongful Convictions, until the Guardian informed him of the allegations of clients who vanish into inherently coercive police custody. Quote, they just disappear, said Anthony Hill, a criminal defense attorney, until they show up at a district for charging or are just released back out onto the street. 
Jacob Church learned about Homan Square the hard way. On May 16, 2012, he and 11 others were taken there after police infiltrated their protest against the NATO summit. Church says officers cuffed him to a bench for an estimated 17 hours, intermittently interrogating him without reading his Miranda rights to remain silent. It would take another three hours and an unusual lawyer visit through a wired cage before he was finally charged with terrorism-related offenses at the nearby 11th District Station, where he was made to sign papers, fingerprinted, and photographed. In preparation for the NATO protest, Church, who is from Florida, had written a phone number for the National Lawyers Guild on his arm as a precautionary measure. Once taken to Holman Square, Church asked explicitly to call his lawyers and said he was denied. Quote, essentially, I wasn't allowed to make contact with anybody, Church told The Guardian, in contradiction of a police guidance on permitting phone calls and legal counsel to arrestees. Church's left wrist was cuffed to a bar behind a bench in a windowless cinder block cell and his ankles cuffed together. He remained in those restraints for about 17 hours. Quote, I had essentially figured, all right, well, they disappeared us, and so we're probably never going to see the light of day again, Church said. Though the raid attracted major media attention, a team of attorneys could not find Church through 12 hours of active searching. Sarah Glasanamo, Church's lawyer, recalled. No booking record existed. Only after she and others made a major stink with contacts in the offices of the Corporation Council and Mayor Rahm Emanuel did they even learn about Homan Square. They sent another attorney to the facility where he ultimately gained entry and talked to Church through a floor-to-ceiling chain-link metal cage. Finally, hours later, police took Church and his two co-defendants to a nearby police station for booking. After serving two and a half years in prison, Church is currently on parole after he and his co-defendants were found not guilty in 2014 of terrorism-related offenses, but guilty of lesser charges of possessing an incendiary device and the misdemeanor of mob action. The access that NATO three attorneys received to Homan Square was an exception to the rule even if Jacob Church's experience there was not. Three attorneys interviewed by The Guardian report being personally turned away from Homan Square between 2009 and 2013 without being allowed access to their clients. Two more lawyers who hadn't been physically denied described it as a place where police withheld information about their clients' whereabouts. Church was the only person who had been detained at the facility who agreed to talk with The Guardian. Their lawyers say others fear police retaliation. One man in January 2013 had his name changed in the Chicago Central Bookings database and then taken to Homan Square without a record of his transfer being kept, according to Eliza Solowich of Chicago's First Defense Legal Aid. The man, the Guardian understands, wishes to be anonymous. His current attorney declined to confirm Solowich's account. She found out where he was after he was taken to the hospital with a head injury. Quote, he said that the officers caused his head injuries in an in interrogation room in Homan Square. I had been looking for him for six to eight hours, and every department member I talked to said they had never heard of him, Solowich said. Quote, he sent me a phone pic of his head injuries because I had seen him in a police station right before he was transferred to Homan Square without any. Bartmas, another Chicago attorney, said in September 2013 she got a call from a mother worried that her 15-year-old son had been picked up by police before dawn. A sympathetic sergeant followed up with the mother to say her son was being questioned at Homan Square in connection to a shooting and would be released soon. When hours passed, Bartmas traveled to Homan Square only to be refused entry for nearly an hour. An officer told her, quote, well, you can't just stand here taking notes. This is a secure facility, and there are undercover officers, and you're making people very nervous, Bartmas recalled. Told to leave, she said she would return in an hour if the boy was not released. He was home and not charged after 12, maybe 13 hours in custody. On February 2, 2013, John Hubbard was taken to Holman Square. Hubbard never walked out. The Chicago Tribune reported that the 44-year-old was found unresponsive inside an interview room and pronounced dead.
After publication, the Cook County Medical Examiner told The Guardian that the cause of death was determined to be heroin intoxication. Holman Square is hardly concerned exclusively with terrorism. Several special units operate outside of it, including the anti-gang and anti-drug forces. If police want money, guns, drugs, or information on the flow of any of them onto Chicago streets, they bring them there and use it as a place of interrogation off the books, Hill said. A former Chicago detective and current private investigator, Bill Dorsch, said he had not heard of the police abuses described by Church and lawyers for other suspects who had been taken to Holman Square. He has been permitted access to the facility to visit one of its main features, an evidence locker for the police department. Transferring detainees through police custody to deny them access to legal counsel would be a, quote, career ender, Dorsch said. To move just for the purpose of hiding them, I can't see that happening, he told The Guardian. Richard Bresrick, Chicago's police superintendent from 1980 to 1983, who also said he had no first knowledge of abuses at Holman Square, said it was, quote, never justified to deny access to attorneys. Quote, Holman Square should be on the same list as every other facility where you can call central booking and say, can you tell me if this person is in custody and where, Bresrick said. If you're going to be doing this, then you have to include Home and Square on the list of facilities that prisoners are taken and a record made. It can't be an exempt facility. Indeed, Chicago police guidelines appear to ban the sort of practices church and the lawyers said occur at Home and Square. A directive titled, quote, Processing Persons Under Department Control instructs that, quote, investigation or interrogation of an arrestee will not delay the booking process, and arrestees must be allowed, quote, a reasonable number of telephone calls to attorneys swiftly, quote, after their arrival at the first place of custody. Another directive, quote, arrestee and in-custody communications, says police supervisors must, quote, allow visitation by attorneys. Attorney Scott Finger and the Chicago police tightened the latter directive in 2012 after quiet complaints from lawyers about their lack of access to Home and Square. Without those changes, church's attorneys might not have gained entry at all. But that tightening about a week before Church's arrest did not prevent Church's prolonged detention without a lawyer, nor the later cases where lawyers were unable to enter. The combination of holding clients for long periods while concealing their whereabouts and denying them access to a lawyer struck legal experts as a throwback to the worst excesses of Chicago police abuse with a post-9-11 feel to it. On a smaller scale, Holman Square is, quote, analogous to the CIA's black sites, said Andrea Lyon, a former Ch- Chicago public defender and current dean of Valdezario University Law School. When she practiced law in Chicago in the 1980s and 1990s, she said, police used the term shadow site to refer to the quasi-disappearances now in place at Holman Square. Quote, back when I first started working on torture cases and started representing criminal defendants in the early 1970s, my clients often told me that they'd been taken from one police station to another before ending up at Area 2, where they were tortured, said Taylor, the civil rights lawyer most associated with pursuing the notoriously abusive Area 2 police commander John Burge. And in that way, the police prevent their families and lawyers from seeing them until they could coerce, through torture or other means, confessions from them. Police often have off-site facilities to have private conversations with their informants. But a retired Washington, D.C. homicide detective, James Trainum, could not think of another circumstance nationwide where police held people incommunicado for extended periods. Quote, I've never known any kind of organized, secret place where they go and just hold somebody before booking for hours and hours and hours. That scares the hell out of me that that even exists or might exist, said Trainum, who now studies national policing issues to include interrogations for the Innocence Project and the Constitution Project. Regardless of departmental regulations, police frequently deny or elide access to lawyers even at regular police precincts, said Solowij of First Defense Legal Aid. But she said the outright denial was exacerbated at Chicago's secretive interrogation and holding facility. 
It's very, very rare for anyone to experience their constitutional rights in Chicago police custody, or even more so at Homan Square, Solowitz said. Church said that one of his more striking memories of Homan Square was the big, big vehicles police had inside the complex that looked very much like MRAPs that they used in the Middle East. Cook County, home of Chicago, has received some 1,700 pieces of military equipment from a much-criticized Pentagon program transferring military gear to local police. It includes a Humvee, according to a local ABC News report. Tracy Siska, criminologist and civil rights activist with the Chicago Justice Project, said that Homan Square, as well as the unrelated case of ex Guantanamo interrogator and retired Chicago detective Richard Zuli, showed the lines blurring between domestic law enforcement and overseas military operations. Quote, the real danger in allowing practices like Guantanamo or Abu Ghraib is the fact that they always creep into other aspects, Siska said. Quote, they creep into domestic law enforcement, either with weaponry like with the militarization of police or interrogation practices. That's how we ended up with the black site in Chicago. That article was posted at The Guardian and is called The Disappeared. Chicago police detain Americans at abuse-laden black site. And of course, this is the great danger of the use of violence and force around the world uh, through wars under the ostensible purpose of protecting Americans from you know, danger around the world. And libertarians are very conscious of violence in society. And we kind of point out that when the government uh, overrides people's preferences by laws and by rules that they pass uh, enforced by the police, then we are seeing violence being done to people. And wars are really started because people can't really say whether or not they want to contribute money towards the war or whether they'd prefer not to. Uh, So consider a voluntary situation. So the government would come to you and say, hey, would you like to contribute to the war effort? There's this enemy over there. They're really scary. They might come over here and hurt us. So we have to, you know, protect you guys. Uh, Would you like to pay $40,000 to contribute to the war effort? And then people could consider it. They could say, well, is that enemy really that scary? Is it something that's dangerous? Is it present? Is it something that's going to hurt me? Uh, If so, maybe I'd like to contribute the $40,000 or maybe there's an alternative. Maybe something, uh, some other organization could provide me with a different set of protection um, agencies and uh, abilities that maybe cost less than $40,000. You know, there's, there's alternatives unless you have taxation. And again, libertarians point out that people are being forced against their will in some cases to contribute to organizations and behaviors that they don't particularly like. Now, the argument is generally made that, you know, of course we need the police. Yeah, they do some bad things. Sometimes they set up black sites and they just grab people and put them in there for, you know, days at a time and don't give them access to courts. Uh, Yeah, sometimes they do that kind of, yeah, they beat people up. Yeah, they kill people, stuff like that. But without them, there would be theft and murder and chaos and people burning buildings down and all sorts of terrible stuff would happen, right? Well, we're finding out that that's not really the case. So in Detroit, the police were seriously underfunded because the government didn't have really any money. And so you see all these private security companies popping up and providing that demand to their clients. And uh, we found that it worked very well because the rich people would pay for uh, super services where they would get protection 24-7 and all of this kind of stuff. And then with that extra money, they found that these security companies were able to then protect people who didn't have quite as much money because they were being paid uh, so much by the rich people. And so, you know, what, what, what would happen without the police? And so I'd like to read an article now about a uh, Texas town who experienced a 61% drop in crime after firing their police department. Sharpstown is a Texas community located just southwest of Houston, and the way they maintain security in this community has gotten our attention. In 2012, they fired their cops. The Sharpstown Civic Association then hired SEAL Security Solutions, a private firm, to patrol their streets. The statist fearmongers will have you believe that privatizing anything would result in mass chaos and a Mad Max scenarios of warlords and rampant crime. But they are wrong. 
Quote, since we've been in there, an independent crime study that they have done indicates we've reduced crime by 61% in just 20 months, says James Alexander, director of operations for SEAL. Government police, despite not acting like it, are still part of the government. This means that any progressive change for the better takes 10 times longer than it would in the private sector, if it happens at all. Government police are not driven by efficiency and threats from liability, as neither one of these things are needed when you have a tax farm to rob when things get tight. Contrary to the government apparatus, private police must be efficient as well as safe, for one small mistake or claim could end their entire operation. If an inefficiency is spotted within the system, changes must be implemented swiftly to avoid the loss of revenue. The reason for the success rate of SEAL security is that they can see a problem quickly adapt versus trying to spin the rusty cogs of the bureaucratic process. And that is exactly what SEAL did in Sharpston. According to Guns.com, Alexander cites the continuous patrol of SEAL's officers in their assigned neighborhoods, as opposed to the strategy of intermittent presence that the constable embraced. Quote, on a constable patrol contract, it's either a 70-30 or an 80-20, meaning they patrol your community 70% of the time, while 30% of the time they use for running calls out of your area or for writing reports. He continues, the second thing that drastically reduces the crime is that we do directed patrols, meaning we don't just put an officer out there and say, here, go patrol. We look at the recent crime stats and we work off those crime stats. So if we have hot spots in those areas, say, for that month, we focus and concentrate our efforts around those hot spots. Another aspect, and possibly the most important, that sets privatized police apart from agents of the state is that they have a negative incentive to initiate force. Force and violence are vastly more expensive than today's police lead us to believe. Causing injury or death or wrong wrongfully depriving someone of their rights is very expensive if these costs are realized for the ones who cause them. The state does not care, however. They can and will defer their liability to the tax farm. The act of deferment of liability is a function solely reserved for the state, and it creates an incentive to act in an unethical manner. In the case of SEAL security, each of their officers, as well as their entire operation, can be held liable both criminally and financially. This is something about which the state knows nothing. As Guns.com pointed out, over 70 communities in Harris County and most of the major management districts have contracted with SEAL. They're less expensive, better at crime prevention, and they do not target their citizens for revenue. And best of all, each officer is personally accountable for his or her actions. Law enforcement is a product that we are forced to buy. When any product is not subject to the forces of consumer demand, there is no way of changing it. It is time we applied the fundamental lesson of competition to our supposed protectors. That article was called, A Texas Town Experiences 61% Drop in Crime After Firing Their Police Department. And you can read it on freethoughtproject.com. So I hope that you enjoyed this presentation. This has been the Austrian Circle, and we will be back next week for another episode here on WHUS Stores 91.7 FM. Have a great week. Take care.